What's good everybody, I'm Keandre, this is Hoopin' Elect, and welcome back to the channel. And as you can tell by the title of the video, we're gonna be talking some early thoughts on the 2024 NBA draft class with this big board. Now this might end up being the most interesting draft that I've scouted on YouTube. There's a lot of uncertainty everywhere. Everyone seemingly has a different opinion on who number one is. I'm not really confident in any of the, the most popular guys right now, but I still think we gotta give them the freedom to emerge and surprise in all parts of the draft before we put this big label on the class as a whole. 2020 is a good example of that, and even 22 coming into the year had a, a decent amount of uncertainty. But yeah, it's extremely early. I still need to watch more of everybody. The board is gonna change by the preseason and honestly probably by the middle of next week. So. Keep in mind that none of this is concrete at the moment. We'll talk 40 players in detail and touch on about 50 total. And we've got this watch list here of some others that are in the mix. There's tons of more names that are not on here. I'll save those for later. I think my, my list goes out to like 207 right now, but um, everyone that is listed, you'll likely hear of throughout the year. And with all that being said, let's go ahead and get it started. Now getting into this top 50, there's a mix of older returners and potential one and dones. Caleb Foster out of Duke being one of them. I still need to watch more of him, but I also think it might be tough for him to establish his stock in the place that he wants it with the amount of guys that are there in the backcourt. Others like Milan Momchilovic and Burke Bujuktenshield going to Iowa State and UCLA respectively have impressed me to this point. And then even some of those that were on the watch list and Xavier Booker out of Michigan State, Sean Stewart at Duke 2, uh, Jackson Shelstead and Kwame Evans at Oregon and Dennis Evans from Louisville are some other guys that'll be in the mix. And then returner wise, we've got JJ Starling transferring to Syracuse this year. Bob Bob Miller still intrigues as a big wing at Florida State. Miles Kelly quietly had a breakout sophomore year at Georgia Tech. I think he's in for a big year this year. Baylor Shireman still worth considering out of Creighton. I love Zurich Phelps game at SMU and then We've got London Johnson back for his second year with the Ignite after showing promise in year one. And finally, Tijon Saloon is a French wing who I think might just be a 2025 guy given his age, but I like him quite a bit. And he may be in there after I get to watch more than just the U18s for him. First off, hopes for a speedy recovery for Bronny James, who suffered cardiac arrest in practice a few weeks ago. He was released from the hospital within 48 hours and seems to be on track to being okay. So we'll see how this ends up affecting his freshman season at USC as we get more details. But prior to the incident, I had felt like he was starting to actually become underrated. And I still would have had him in the first round entering the year. So really glad he's okay. You never want to see anybody deal with something as serious as that. And we'll hopefully get to dive into all of that and more of his on quarter abilities later on. Now getting into this top 40, Deron Holmes has returned to Dayton for his junior season and he'll look to continue building on what was great progress for him. We know he can fill it up on the interior at this level. He's an impressive shot blocker and to me it's just going to be about where he goes physically, the three point shot and certain little things in the pick and roll that I'll be watching. But he's pretty safely on my board at this point and I don't see that changing too much throughout the year. And I think he's going to hear his name get called next June. Tennessee's Cameron Carr is one of the more underrated potential one and done prospects in this class to me. He spent the last two seasons playing for Link Academy, winning Geico this year. He's part of that MoCan team that won Peach Jam last year. He's performed well on high level prep stages in a 6'5", 6'6", guard with a ridiculous 7'1", wingspan who projects really well as a shooter, has some potential off the bounce, and competes defensively. To me, belongs in high consideration. Now, I think he could be a two year guy. He'll need to continue growing physically and into his body, but he is someone I like a lot long term and think he has the pieces to be a real pro. Arkansas's Trevin Brazil had an easy first round trajectory before suffering a season ending torn ACL in December. And to me, even more than Nick Smith Jr.'s injuries, I think that one probably hurt them the most as a team. Nonetheless, Brazil will have a chance to once again show his combination of athletic tools, shooting upside and defensive versatility as a forward, and in the process make first round noise once again. Arizona's Kylan Boswell came into last season as one of the youngest players in college basketball, playing the entirety of his freshman year as a 17-year-old, and though it wasn't amazing and he was recovering from an injury in the first part of the season, he did show a lot of promise over the course of the year. I love him defensively at the point of attack, I think he can be an absolute pest there even at 6'2". He's shifty with the ball in his hands, a really solid playmaker, good shooter. He's got all the tools to be a complimentary NBA guard. He'll be playing alongside two prominent transfer guards in Jaden Bradley from Alabama and Caleb Love from UNC which should be very interesting to kind of see how that dynamic works but 
I think Boswell will make it happen and he'll enter the year as someone I'll be watching pretty closely. Nikola Jurisic is someone we talked about throughout last season and I think he'll be in first round conversations in this one. He's a 6'8 wing who though didn't shoot a great percentage last year, I expect that to be a part of his game in the future. He's capable of being a secondary playmaker and though he's not the most naturally gifted individually defensively, he has good size and can hold his own in help. Playing for Mega, we'll look to see him take some big steps forward next year and maximize some of that potential. Jurisic. Zvonimir Ivizic is one of the more unique players in this class. He's a 7-2 forward from Croatia and has been a guy we've been keeping our eye on for a couple of years, but his recent performance in the U20s was one that boosted his draft buzz. Now he's very far from a finished product right now, but his combination of fluidity at that size mixed with the ability to affect the game in a lot of different ways, whether it's handling, protecting the rim, finishing plays, or stepping out and shooting it. He's going to be a great addition to Kentucky and SEC basketball. I don't know how Calipari will use him. That'll be a story in itself, how he puts together this roster. But Ivizic has a really intriguing skill set and should be mentioned at this point of the year. Reclassifying up to 2023 and heading to Louisville, Trenton Flowers has a really intriguing game as a 6'8 versatile wing who is a fantastic athlete and has played different roles across settings and teams and found success. He's shown flashes of pull up and shooting ability, some playmaking ability off of his own attacks, he competes defensively, and I think he's got quite a bit of upside overall. Louisville has been kind of in limbo these last several years, but Kenny Payne, Flowers, and some of the other talent over there will look to change that narrative quickly, and I think Flowers could end up being a real first round prospect. Terry Darlin is one of several intriguing prospects on his G League Knight squad. He's a 6'6 guard slash wing out of the NBA Academy in Senegal and though he's still a bit raw, he has impressed me as a shot maker and playmaker and in making plays defensively to this point. Now he's a prospect I think could suffer just from the amount of mouths to feed with this Ignite team and just jumping to this level, but he's definitely someone to watch this year. Aaron Bradshaw has a sought after skill set as a 7 footer who can protect the rim, serve as a play finisher and has shown signs of being able to stretch the floor long term. He recently had surgery for a foot fracture which isn't the best start for anybody but the hope is he'll be available for the start of the regular season. Now I've got a few more questions about his mobility and some on his motor than those who already like him as an instant lottery pick but health willing he'll have a ton of first round buzz and deservedly so. Houston's Terrence Arsenal was another guy I was fairly high on coming into last season, and though it became clear one and done wasn't going to happen, he still had a really nice freshman season and contributed for one of the better teams in the country. He's in a great position to break out as a sophomore as a 6'6 wing with impressive shooting upside and the ability to sit down and guard when he wants to. The creation and just overall offensive leap he makes will determine his stock, but for me, he's high on the list of sophomores that'll make real NBA noise this year. Bobby Clintman had one of the weirdest pre-draft runs that we're really ever going to see. He was pretty much a shoe-in to just test the waters and then return back to Wake Forest for a potential breakout season, but he then forewent his eligibility, signing an agent, had a bunch of random near lottery buzz that wasn't as substantial as some thought. He ends up pulling out of the draft past the NCAA return date, then heads to the NBL in Australia to play for Cairns. I still think he's a potential first round pick in this class as a big wing who has had some elite flashes as a shooter, connective passer, and defender, but it'll be a test for him on the pro level and I'm intrigued to see how he performs in this sort of bet on yourself approach. He didn't have the greatest performance for Team USA in the U19s, but I am still a believer in incoming Iowa State freshman Omaha Bilyeu. He's a 6'8 forward slash wing who we've seen play a few different ways in different settings over the years, but his help defense, athleticism, and energy on the glass should translate most, and I like the high level flashes he's shown as a creator and think the shot is workable though that'll be a key to his success. He played with Mo Can in the summers, he was a member of that PGM winner, he went to Link as a junior alongside Jordan Walsh and Julian Phillips, won a lot there. I like his potential and he'll be someone I'll be watching pretty closely. Outside of Bronny James, Jared McCain is probably the most popular player in this class because of TikTok and social media, but he's got real game too. He's a composed guard who can play on and off the ball, he can shoot it, he makes good decisions and has good feel on both ends of the floor. And he's not the most athletic, but he gets the job done in a lot of ways. Now with him and Caleb Foster, like we mentioned briefly earlier, there is a strong possibility that he could stay for two years. 
especially considering he'll be playing a lot behind Proctor and Roach. But I like his game enough already and have heard a lot of good things about his progression this summer to throw him in there at this point. Jan Vide is a 6'6 guard headed to this UCLA team that is stacked with international talent and makes up one of the more interesting rosters I've seen in college basketball. He's been one of the more impactful players in international competitions over the last three years for Slovenia and Real Madrid, making a good impression in FIBA and the ANGT competitions at his age groups. He has a lot of appeal as a creator. I love his craftiness and pace, and despite not being the best athlete, he's consistently making it happen, and it should be fun to watch him bring his game to college. There's a good chance Trey Alexander is one of the best players in college basketball this season as a junior for Creighton. Last season he emerged as a serious threat making significant improvements in all facets of his game, being super efficient as a scorer and taking on more ball handling responsibilities. With Brian Nimhard and Arthur Kaluma gone, he'll likely get another uptick in usage and I'm interested to see where he takes it as a 6'5 combo guard. Adem Bona emerged over the course of last season for UCLA and likely would have been picked somewhere from the late first to the mid second in the 2023 draft, but as a returner he's got a much easier path to going in the first round. He's an athletic energy big at 6'10 who can finish plays around the rim and took some steps forward in his field defensively to match some of the athletic capabilities he has. Now he's been dealing with a shoulder injury since the end of last season and will miss the Bruins foreign tour in August, but if he's good to go like they think he is for the season, he should be a staple in first round convos and be a big part of one of the most interesting front courts and rosters we've seen in recent college basketball. Cody Williams is a 6'8 5 star wing headed to Colorado with a ton of potential and he happens to be the younger brother of the OKC Thunders, Jalen Williams. Cody is an interesting prospect in this class to me because I think best case he's like a top 10-ish pick but there's still a lot of questions to be answered and patience to be had with his game. And briefly getting into it, he's a lanky wing with intriguing ball handling and creation skills and can be a big time threat getting to the bucket and to his spots. And he's also got the tools to make an impact on defense. Now, some of the concerns with him playing through physicality, the motor, and as a shooter have popped up in different settings. And I think that's where we see some of the early opinions split. But I do like his game and I'm excited to see how he looks in the middle of this experienced Colorado team. To me, Kyle Filipowski was one of the biggest surprise returners as he certainly would have been drafted and had fans as high as the late teens in the 2023 draft. He's a legit seven footer with intriguing perimeter skills and the ability to also get on the glass and score on the interior. I think the biggest questions for him will come from who he is at the next level. One, he's got to shoot the ball much better as a primary stretch guy and then not being a big time rim protector or much more than okay as a perimeter defender. That can kind of muddy some things defensively especially for what that means for him being a four or five. So that'll be watched closely by scouts, but he is still very talented and should play a big role in taking Duke on a deep tournament run. Elliot Cadeau made the decision to reclassify up and head to North Carolina a year earlier than he was on track for, which I think was the right one considering his age, but he's a dynamic playmaking guard at 6 foot or 6 one who makes some elite reads and can fit passes into tight windows. He's a capable self creator with a healthy amount of moves in his bag and an underrated athlete. Now he is undersized and you guys know how difficult it is for smaller guards to get drafted in the first round, let alone find success in the NBA, but I do think Cadeau has the skill set to be mentioned here. He's one of the most fun watches in this class to me, at least to this point, and, and he should give the Tar Heels a different look at that position than they've had in recent years. We talked a lot about Judah Mintz last year, and though I would have drafted him, I think he made the right decision in going back to Syracuse. At 6'3", he's a big time shot creating guard who can make plays for others and showed about as much as he could defensively within that zone making plays. He also performed pretty well in the combine scrimmages, and I think he's set up to be a first round pick this year. Now, for him, the biggest thing is going to be the three point shot. He knows that. I know that's the feedback that he got from NBA teams. That's what's probably going to decide like 80% of his stock this year. But I like the all around pieces that he's shown so far. And I think it'll be someone that could go as high as the lottery. Did not bear fruit. Now Mintz, a little breakaway here. Toying with Tan. Gets 
AJ Johnson is one of the most popular and recognizable players in this class given his connection to Jalen Green. And though they're often referred to as brothers, they're actually not related by blood. But like Green, AJ decided to bypass college, originally committed to Texas, and head to the Illawarra Hawks of the NBL. He's a 6'6 scoring guard who's a good athlete, can shoot it, and loves to create off the bounce. Now, there are some questions with his ability to handle that physicality and on the defensive end, but he's made some really impressive progress to his body over the last six months and looks to be on the right track to fulfilling more of his potential. I like his game a lot and he'll enter the year as a first round prospect for me. After decommitting from Duke, McKenzie and Baco decided to go to Indiana, and I think that's going to end up being a pretty good situation for him. At 6'8", he can operate as a wing and loves to create shots on a perimeter, but he also has the ability to play more on the inside as a four. He's got upside as a shooter and shows some impressive moments as a help defender from what I've seen so far, and it'll be interesting to see how he's used alongside Kalel Ware and Malik Renew in that front court. but overall he's got a nice combination of size and skill and could really assert himself in this class. Zachary Rizache is a 6'8 wing out of France who has spent the last several years playing at the Asvel Junior Club level and got some opportunities to contribute with the big team and has to this point received a lot of high end lottery buzz. I'd say I'm a little more hesitant to put him there based off of what I've seen but a guy that size who can really defend in multiple spots has a lot of high level playmaking moments and a few flashes as a shot maker there is a case to be made there long term. He just hasn't stood out to me in that way just yet and that remained the case in the U. 19s recently but he is still intriguing and it is very early so he'll be someone to continue to keep your eye on internationally I still find Kello Ware to be a really intriguing prospect. A lot of the potential concerns we had coming into last season showed up at Oregon in the motor, the discipline and handling on the glass, but he also wasn't set up for success given the construction of that team. Now headed to Indiana under Mike Woodson and being the successor to Trace Jackson Davis, Ware will have a great opportunity to show off his unique skill set as an agile seven footer who has the potential to space the floor, finish above the rim and cover a lot of ground defensively. I think he has a lot of potential and the combination of he, Malik Renu, and Mackenzie Mbako in the front court should be a really interesting one to watch. Francis Melvin Agensa has been one of the bigger international risers over the last year and change, and I think now he'll have a real shot at going in the first round. He's an athletic lefty wing at 6'7", who just averaged nearly 20 points a game for France in the U19 World Cup, showcasing some big time improvements to his game, especially as a shooter and flashes of some high level creation, and of course, some intriguing defensive capabilities taking on the toughest matchups. His team is moving up to Pro A this year, so we'll get a really good look at him and what he can do, and I think he'll continue to ascend from there and be in first round conversations. Jacoby Walter is a 6'5 two guard or wing headed to Baylor. He's a talented scorer and plays well through physicality but the thing I like most about him is his defense and I think Scott Drew is going to love him for that reason too. First and foremost, it should be interesting to see how he's used offensively alongside Ray J. Dennis, Jaden Nunn, and Links to Love. We've seen Jacoby play a few different roles both at Link Academy last year and on the Adidas circuit but I think he'll figure it out and he's a pretty good bet to land as a one and done given his two way abilities. Garway Duall is a 6'5 guard headed to Providence and someone I think has one of the better chances at outperforming his high school rankings. He's been steadily progressing over the last few years and turned heads last year at SoCal Academy and then at the Nike Hoop Summit this spring. He's a disruptive defender who has great hands, covers ground, and can hound players at the point of attack and that should continue to be a huge part of his game. Then offensively, he's a smooth and quick driver with a nice handle who makes plays and probably has more potential as a shot maker than he's shown to this point. I really like his game and think he has lottery upside and he should make a lot of noise in the Big East, potentially on the way to being a one and done. Good hand there by Duval. Another top returner in this class, Riley Kugel really turned it on in those last tennis games of the season as Colin Castleton went down with an injury and being able to operate with the ball more than ever, he really shined. At 6'5", Kugel is a really talented scorer from many parts of the floor. He excels in pick and roll and took on the toughest matchups defensively a lot of the time. He'll have a lot more responsibility and look to improve as a table setter and decision maker and that'll ultimately determine a lot of his ceiling and stock but he'll likely enter the year somewhere in this range for me.
KU's own Marco Jackson has a chance to be one of the premier guards in this class. He's super quick and shifty and excels at getting downhill. He's one of the more talented creators and is capable of making an impact at the point of attack on defense. Now Kansas already has Dewan Harris, Arterio Morris is transferring in. You've also got to factor in Kevin McCullough and Hunter Dickinson in that offense. So it may not be the most freedom or runway for a guy, I think the caliber of El Marco, but he should still be able to showcase his game and prove himself worthy of being one of the top players in the class even in the context that he's playing in. After spending the last couple years with overtime elite, French big man Alex Saar is headed to the Perth Wildcats of the NBL in Australia. His combination of fluidity and athleticism as a 7-1 big man, along with his ability to play both inside and out offensively and the versatility he has on defense, make him someone I think should be considered in the lottery. It'll be an adjustment for him in the NBL, especially with the physicality, but I think he belongs here. And if you did not know, he is the younger brother of former Kentucky Wildcats in Oklahoma City Thunder, Olivier Saar. Even playing just 13 minutes a game last season, Donovan Klingon's productivity as a mobile 7-2 big man who put up rim protecting numbers on par with a lot of the elite guys made him a potential first round pick in 2023, but he made the quick decision to stay at UConn and lead what is going to be another extremely competitive team. We'll be watching how he handles bigger minutes, how he grows as a playmaker and free throw shooter, but he's got a highly valuable NBA archetype and in a class full of question marks at the top, he's someone I have very few about by Danny Hurley not giving them a chance to Duke's Tyrese Proctor should be in for a breakout sophomore season after really turning it on down the stretch as a freshman. He's a 6'5 combo guard originally out of Australia whose creativity off the dribble, pacing the pick and roll and feel as a playmaker headline his abilities as a player. But he's also a pretty good defender in multiple ways when he wants to be and for all those reasons he just edges out Klingon as my top returner in the class. Now Duke has some talented guards there alongside him but I think Proctor will have the keys and assert himself as as their guy and potentially be a lottery pick this season. If things go according to plan, Kentucky guard DJ Wagner will be the first third generation NBA player in history with his dad Dewan and grandpa Milt also spending time in the league. But getting into DJ's game, he's got a knack for scoring the ball and creating shots about as well as anyone in his class. He consistently gets paint touches despite not being a supreme athlete. And on the other end, he's a pretty competitive defender as well. Now the three point shot improving is going to be key for him, but I buy the touch and mechanics at this point. And then he'll need to progress as a playmaker at that size to ultimately fulfill his potential but right now I have him in the lottery and we'll see how he grows and develops in those specific areas. Spain's Adai Mara is a 7-3 big man with excellent feel and a knack for making extraordinary passes for his teammates, especially out of the post. And his productivity in the European U18s has been a great look at where his game could be headed in the future. He previously had a contract dispute with his club, but that was resolved and he is headed to UCLA next season, which should be a super interesting watch. I can't say that that's the best basketball situation for him, just from a program perspective and also with a Dembona already being being there but we will see what happens there there's a whole bunch of talent on that team he's a special playmaking big and play finisher who can protect the rim on the interior but overall just a really fun talent to watch Another UConn Husky, freshman Stefan Castle has a great chance to be a top 10 prospect and potentially even top 5 by the end of the year. He's a 6'6", 6'7", guard who is a naturally talented playmaker and consistently makes plays in the pick and roll. He's able to get to his spots as a scorer on the perimeter and even though he's not the most explosive or elite separator, I do think he's crafty enough to compensate but that'll be something to watch for along with the 3 point shot. But his overall combination of size, skill set and creativity as a playmaker makes him someone I'm really excited to watch playing under coach Hurley and alongside a guy like Donovan Klingon and I really wouldn't put a ceiling on just how high he could go in this class. Ethan Omanza has one of the more interesting recent basketball track records that you're going to see. Originally from Spain, he received MVP of the FIBA U17 World Cup last summer, helping Spain win silver, and he became the first player ever to win both U17 and U19 MVP as Spain won gold a few weeks ago. He spent the last couple years playing in the overtime elite program, which is another absolute win for them, especially being a non-Thompson twin. He's now made the decision to join a really talented team with the G League Ignite next season. 
As for his game, he's a skilled big man at 6'10 who has great touch, he can pass it, has shown flashes as a shooter, and is a versatile defender. And the more I've watched and revisited some things, I think he's got to be a potential lottery guy coming into the season. And I'm excited to see how he asserts himself with this Ignite group, and honestly wouldn't be surprised if he ends up the best prospect out of that bunch. The battle and a direct pass and the reverse no good. Almanza jams it down easily. Ron Holland is a 6'8 forward out of Texas headed to the G League Ignite. He's a high level athlete with an outstanding motor and some intriguing upside as a slasher. He's going a lot as a shooter over the years though he can still improve and then defensively I've been intrigued by his versatility and the energy and think he could make a real impact there as well. I think he's in his range as a top 5 pick and will compete at the top but I'm not 100% sold yet on his offensive skill set to be all in as the number one guy. But again, it is very early and we'll just see how well he progresses this season. Justin Edwards is a 6'8 lefty forward slash wing headed to Kentucky who has some intriguing upside on both ends of the floor. He has the potential to be an impactful attacker that can also get out and handle the ball in transition. He loves getting to the dribble pull up and can at times shoot the three ball as well. And he already showed off a lot of this at the Global Jam. I think he may be in a role that'll force him to have to knock down shots at a higher clip than we've seen from him in the past, so that'll be key. But you combine the offensive upside with some of the versatility and high effort on defense. And it's enough for me at that size to get real top five consideration in this class, even with him being a pretty old freshman. Edwards. Isaiah Collier is one of the premier players here and could end up in contention for the number one pick. Headed to USC, he should be one of the best players in the Pac-12 and really in all of college basketball. He's a stocky built guard with good strength, he's quick getting downhill, he's crafty, he plays with good pace, and has continued to showcase his playmaking in a lot of ways. And for him, a lot will come down to the shooting in all aspects to determine his draft stock and some of the effort and consistency defensively, but right now for me, he's a pretty good bet as one of the top selections in this class. And then Modest Buzelis is currently one of the favorites for the number one pick in the 2024 draft and he lands at the very top for me at the moment. He's a 6'11 wing who finished up high school playing for Sunrise Christian Academy last year and he'll be yet another guy taking his talents to the Ignite. His combination of size, movement abilities, and upside to dribble pass shoot are what put him in this range right now. But like the others, he's still got a lot of work to do, particularly defensively and physically jumping to the pro level. There are far more questions questions with him than any of the other early number one guys I've had in the past so it'll be interesting to see where things go and progress from here but at the moment for me he is the guy at number one. I appreciate y'all for tuning into this video. Got some more stuff planned on the way, maybe some some different type of videos than we've done in the past. So um, stay locked to the channel for all that. But yeah, I'm very curious to hear your guys' thoughts um, at this time of the year, especially with how different this class is to some others. So let me know who you guys are feeling for the number one pick, um, some sleepers, everything in between. Just leave them down in the comments down below. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, I'm Keandre. This is Swoopin' Elect. Until next time, I'm out.